Okay, next up we have my friend Elliot. Elliot, can you hear me? I sure can. How are you doing? Doing good. Okay, I think Colin will bring us up on video. So Colin, you let us know when you're yep. ready. You are already up. And Ellie, I just want to say I live just next to your district. I'm in Sheila Jackson Lee's, but uh, I'm rooting for you. Oh, well, in that case, you can vote for Luke Spencer. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, stepped out just a little bit because I ran as a Democrat for a little state house seat right there because it's like 13,000 votes. Terrible. It was pretty funny being a libertarian because I've never been a Democrat before I was talking about victimless crimes bills and that kind of side, but there's a lot of independent voices in those districts. You know, you're in downtown Houston, there's a lot of different different people. Yeah, very, and Houston's such a diverse uh, community. Yeah, but I'm gonna go on mute and let you guys are already streaming, so I'll let you take it away, Lauren. Yeah, so that was a great segue, thanks, Colin. Obviously, we're all Texans here, so we're not only preparing for, you know, Hurricane Laura coming in, but we have some unique perspective on a diverse community like Houston, on politics at the state and local level. And, you know, Elliot, I appreciate you joining us as a male ally to talk about women's equality today and what those diverse perspectives and voices look like when we look at local elections, you know, county level elections, state level elections. Why is it so important in your mind to have women's voices elevated and activated? Oh, that's a really good question, Lauren. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, the biggest thing is that we, as you know, people who are trying to be leaders for equality, we celebrate uh, all sorts of different voices. If if you um, if you look at the you know record of just presidents in the United States. Uh, there's been a long unbroken chain of just male male voices being heard. And um, clearly, I think it's uh, time for a change for that. Uh, but, um, you know, w when we're talking about what really matters and when it comes to making sure everybody has that equal voice and equal vote and equal representation, um, you know, optics matter. If you have only men who have been in leadership positions like that, then it, it, it's hard for, uh, you know, for young girls growing up to see a role model like that. Um, I think uh, Laura touched on that on the previous segment. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, part of, part of what I, I like to do is um, I like to celebrate um, any kind of uh, way uh, liberty is expressed and, uh, you know, diversity is just the best way to celebrate that. I appreciate that. And I will say that because I know you already, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about yourself and about kind of your role in the Liberty Movement with us? Uh, sure. Thanks. Uh, well, again, my name is Elliot Sherman. I'm uh, here in Houston, Texas, running for uh, Congress in uh, Texas' second district. I got originally involved in the Libertarian Movement probably around the 2008 presidential cycle. Um, that was uh, just coming off of, uh, you know, George Chevy Bush's uh, Several years at that time, it seemed like, uh, you know, endless war in the Middle East, but which is still going on two administrations later. And so I knew I really wasn't going to be interested in supporting a Republican in that race. And um, I was looking into, you know, what the Democrats had to offer. And it just seemed like so much overspending. And I just I couldn't in good conscience support that either. So I was, I guess, a little bit of a free agent. And I was um, speaking with a, a coworker at the time who who kind of asked me what I was interested in. I, I gave him that feedback. He said, oh, you sound like a libertarian. And I said, no, I'm not a liberal. He said, no, libertarian. It's uh, the root word is liberty. You should you should check that out. That sounds like something that you might be interested in. So I went and I uh, took an online quiz or something. And sure enough, I was smack dab in the <laughs> deeply in the libertarian uh, territory. So um, I've uh, been uh, I, I got involved as an activist, uh, you know, over the years and uh, in the local county and eventually state and even uh, the national conventions I've, I've become involved in. And uh, just last year, I decided to go ahead and take the plunge and become a candidate myself because I really got tired of waiting uh, around for a candidate, you know, that I wanted, you know, like someone who I wanted. So I was like, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and do it myself and give uh, the other voters in this district that option uh, that they otherwise wouldn't have. Well, and I think that ties so well to the importance of having diverse voices and also someone who you can relate to that you see running for leadership positions. You know, for me as a woman, I'm not necessarily always going to vote for a woman because I believe they should be the best qualified candidates and there should be alignment with my values. But certainly I'm looking for women in leadership because it helps me to feel confident in my own voice as a leader. And well, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it sounds like uh, you, know, you spoke with some of the Texas leadership in the Libertarian Party earlier today. 
I did. Yes. <laughs> we got some great women here. And, you know, thinking about women's equality and it, kind of the movement as a whole, I think it's something that touches all of us because everyone has a mother. Often there are strong women who have helped men get to the places where they are today. So Elliot, I know some of the strong women in your life. Would you like <laughs> to talk about how they've impacted you? Certainly. Um, well, my uh, my biggest uh, supporter in that campaign, uh, Liz, has just been a rock for me in this campaign. She has just tirelessly helped out. Um, she's actually kind of over there in the background listening right now. So hi, Liz. <laughs> Uh, uh, she also helped uh, helped uh, put on the uh, Let Her Speak uh, uh, protest here in Houston that we had a couple weeks back on August 8th, where we had the, you know, we did the Houston portion of the nationwide protest where we decorated our cars and drove around town. And, um, you know, she she did all, so much work on that. I, I, I There's no way I could have made it anywhere near the success uh, that I could without um, her co-hosting that. And um, we just, we, we're really in alignment in the fact that we, we're tired of what the other parties have to offer. Um, you know, there's there's some who are just outwardly hostile and some who pay lip service, but don't really, you know, in the end come through when it comes to their policy. But what we really want, you know, as, as men and women in this in this movement is for everyone to be treated with, you know, equally and with dignity. And when you have, um, you know, government programs that are based upon controlling people and telling them what to do, mm -hmm. you really get pretty quickly away from that, especially if you have sexist, misogynists, or, you know, racists, or yes. whatever in power, if they have the mechanism to, you know, harm people with that, then they certainly will, and they'll, it'll, they'll make it legal, because that's the way things work. So we, we really oppose that entire concept, and just, we want to let people live the lives they want to live, so long as they're not harming others in the process. I love that, and I think that we've had some great you know, personal stories about that today. I think we've had some great take on, on policy there as well. And one of the things we were discussing earlier was living those principles and how as part of the Liberty Movement, we've identified principles and now we're exploring ways to live them. So when you think about the principles of the Libertarian Party or the Liberty Movement, you know, how would you say they affect women and how can they help empower women? Uh, that's, I, I like that question a lot. Um, so I, I think one of the one of the best things that we can do as leaders in this movement is set a good example for how, you know, how libertarians actually would solve issues that are combating. Um, right uh, right now, uh, Liz, who I mentioned a moment ago, is really in, involved with uh, local charities to help, you know, help out children. Um, shout out to uh, Homemade Hope, uh, which is a Houston-based charity that she's- Yes, really Blair. I'm sorry. <laughs> Go Blair. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, part of setting that example is we don't want the government to, we don't want people to have to rely on the government for help. So we get out there and help communities ourselves. And that's, that's, that's a, a way that we, you know, anyone, uh, male or female can impact the community and really live the principles that we talk about. So it's not just a, a matter of, we don't want to pay taxes and, you know, we don't like the government. I mean, those are true, but we want to help people. We just think that the government's probably not the best way to do it, given the fact that that's the same entity that is currently drone bombing people on the other side of the world. So, you know, we just <laughs> I want to bring a little bit of, uh, you know, connection to our, our communities. And you can't do that by delegating to some bureaucrat. You help your community by getting out there and helping. That's rolling up yes. your sleeves and, you know, donating money where you can, donating time where you can, just or if it's even lending some of your professional uh, you know, your professional capabilities that mm -hmm. would help, uh, you know, nonprofits in your group. Those are all different ways that we can live those principles. I love that. And I think it speaks to one of the things that really attracted me um, is that I was raised to be a servant leader. I was raised to put others first and to seek ways that I could give of my time and my talents. And uh, this started within my church. And, you know, libertarians very deeply believe in the separation of church and state, but we support very actively your right to practice in the faith in which you choose. And we believe strongly in, you know, the sovereignty of the community. And knowing that servant leaders and those that are attracted to volunteering and supporting their communities directly, that speaks right to our principles and our values. Yeah, so it, it certainly does. And um, something I like to do is uh, is just kind of live conspicuous libertarianism. So I, I know that <laughs> I <I'm>, like it. 
I, I'm very outspoken, as anyone who follows me on social media would know. Um, in in that, I like to say, "Hey, this is this is what libertarians are thinking. This is this is how libertarians would do something differently." And if you're setting a good example, people will start to see, and they'll become more receptive to what you're talking about. You won't just be some you know crank uh, you know fringe movement that they that you know their someone in their party told them about and told them to criticize. You'll be a, an actual living person and, as an example. And maybe you know it might not um, might not happen the first time you make a post, but if you are a consistently good person and you're consistently helping others and you're consistently communicating ways that um, you know we can solve society's problems without government force, mm-hmm. people tend to pick that up. But it 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 really helps to be consistent like that. I love that, and you know I'd say that's part of putting your money where your mouth is, but it's so much more than that, right? It's so much more than you know your your treasure, but your time as well. And, you know, allowing others to not only see how you're living those principles, but actively engaging them and learning from them about the principles and values that matter to them. And Elliot, I know that's something that you're passionate about, being a good listener, being a good learner. Yeah, I'm the, well, something that I really like that sets us apart, uh, especially in this election cycle, is just the explosion of of women who are becoming more involved in the party. And they're, you know, the Libertarian Party has had a little bit of a stigma of being a boys club for a while, yeah. mostly because it's just, it's it's a little bit off the, you know, beaten path and a lot of people aren't necessarily open to that. And another thing we've gotten better about is um, being more inclusive in our messaging. And once you do that, and once you, you know, work to stop being quite so bristly like the porcupines uh, that we <laughs> use as our, as our mascot, um, you know, people become more receptive to hearing what you have to say. And in, in that in that regard, like I said, especially in this election cycle, we've got an amazing candidate for president right now, Dr. Joe Jorgensen. And uh, the, the fact that the media is still shutting her out and not even giving her a chance in the polls yes. to be included in these debates, uh, that's, that's, you know, it's, it's crazy. We have an amazing, qualified, intelligent, thoughtful, principled candidate, and she's getting no, no coverage whatsoever. And she's going up against, you know, two people who have very questionable ethical pasts and not to mention a lot of bad policy uh, baggage along the way. So I, I think that if you took out all of the media coverage, took out all of the, you know, 24 hour news cycle and just put someone in a room and just listen to all three candidates, she would win easily. So what we need to do, you know, what we need to do to help support her and other women in this movement is to help share her message help share that she wants to help solve um you know solve people's problems in ways that aren't necessarily the traditional you know let's throw a lot of government money at it Mm -hmm. Uh, you know empowering people is something that should respond really um really strongly to people especially feminists who might uh be listening to what libertarians have to say for the first time given you know her as a, a spokesperson well and i love elliot that you brought up uh, the history of voter suppression and how women's voices have historically been suppressed, similar to how third party candidates or other parties have been oppressed, we know that those in power don't wanna give it up and that they will employ tactics to make sure that either women's voices aren't heard or the black community is not heard, the LGBT community, Native American community. So when we think about the issues of women equality, you know, I see that across the board that those in power don't want to give it up and they will suppress and fight those who are seeking it. Uh, We're going to get a chance to talk to Casey a little bit later, um, more about her vision for Let Her Speak. But it's a hard road if you're a third party candidate. And I know that you can speak to that personally. Uh, I I certainly can. Um, I did have a a recent experience. Um, I don't want to put too much on it because it is a very active legal situation. But uh, needless to say, a certain major party is doing everything they can legally to make sure that they don't have any competition. And that's as much as I can talk about uh, since it's an ongoing legal dispute. Um, but I, I, you know, we're the good guys in this. <laughs> and, um, you know, well, we, why don't we, 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 we won't talk about the legal fight, but let's okay. talk maybe, let's talk maybe about ballot access and the challenge for a third party or an independent candidate, anyone who's not part of the, the power or the elite, what is the challenge in, in getting ballot access? What does that mean for us? Well, if, if you're not a Republican or a Democrat, then you are not automatically on a ballot. And the Republicans and Democrats made rules in almost every state that's, that stipulates that. So right off the bat, 
they can just waltz right into uh, any race they want in the country and have their you know party represented with whichever candidate they end up, end up selecting. If you are a Libertarian uh, Party member or a Green Party member or mm -hmm. an Independent or any other of the handful of uh, you know different um, parties that have multi-state representation across the United States, then you have to jump through all sorts of hoops and get all sorts of signatures and um, you know raise all sorts of funds and it's a huge giant distraction and we're already at a disadvantage by having smaller parties. Yes. So they, you know, these, these two major parties, they've got unlimited funds. They've got donors who just, you know, utilize super PACs to funnel all sorts of millions of dollars, you know, to the, to candidates across the country. And we're just fighting to get our name on the ballot. Yes. Uh, the amount of time and effort it takes uh, just to, just to get that to happen is, is it distracts thoroughly from the actual campaign itself. So yes. you have, the you know the two parties that make the rules that favor themselves it's it's totally you know it's it's circular logic and it's 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 frankly completely ridiculous <laughs> um, I, I i think the fact that most americans don't understand the way the process works is why they keep is why they keep getting away with it so yes. um you know thank you for giving us this forum so we can broadcast the uh, yes yeah, the inherent conflict of interest of allowing uh, people to select who their own competition is w when it comes to selecting political leadership. Um, yeah. I, e even if you aren't particularly uh, interested in any election, I would really ask that you, uh, uh, you know, who, who's watching this, number one, get registered to vote. You can do so up to 30 days out from the election. So I believe uh, October 3rd is the mm -hmm. uh, is the cutoff for yes. on election day. Correct. And if you want to get um, if you want to get registered in time to early vote, then you'd have to do that um, about midway through September. So mm -hmm. uh, you have about, uh, what is it, uh, you know, three or four weeks left mm -hmm. before that registration window starts closing. So please, please register to vote. Tell your friends who aren't registered to register to vote and show up in the, in the polls. And if you have no opinion, vote against the incumbent. I don't care which party you vote for, vote against the incumbent. Because if, you, if, if they keep getting rewarded with this bad behavior, they're just going to keep doing it. Yes. So, I love that you said that. I was like screaming this in the shower this morning. <laughs> <laughs> that if you aren't happy with the status quo, vote against your incumbent. Let's end qualified immunity for politicians. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and also for uh, other public servants uh, while we're at it. Uh, that would be a lot to stop all of the uh, systemic uh, violence. And, and guess what? The riots would stop overnight, Congress, if you want to end qualified immunity. That's how you get them to stop. You don't need the yes. National Guard. You don't need rubber Amen. bullets. You don't need tear gas. End qualified immunity. And yes. the riots and the protests will stop. Will stop. It's that easy. And I, I think this is especially relevant on today, Women's Equality Day, celebrating you know 100 years of, of giving us the right to vote. Because the right to vote wasn't enough in that there was a legal precedent that said, OK, now you can. Then we have to think about the barriers to access. Voter registration is one of them. Ballot access is one of them. Women who historically in the past were tied to the home and to children. So when we think about all of the ways that women's voices have been suppressed or barriers have been put in front of them, either to vote, to vote for a candidate that they believe in, or to run for office, we're talking about a long history that we are still working to overcome, right? Just this week, uh, there have been rumblings in the GOP with their convention about implementing a one household vote rule. Can, like, what decade is this? I, did, I didn't even hear that. Oh my God. Yeah, it's, it's like they're, they're watching The Handmaid's Tale and using that as a playbook for how to, you know, advance America and their vision. It's wild. It's something that I'd like, I don't understand how anyone with a conscience can stay affiliated with that group. Um, that's why we're trying to offer a better alternative here. If you care yes. about your rights and you want, you know, your voice heard, we've got all the infrastructure in place. Right now, all we need is, uh, you know, support from people who have just been disillusioned. It's time to, you know, rally around a cause that can actually change something. Well, and Elliot, I would love for you to speak a little bit about your experience getting on the ballot, because women that are interested in maybe running for office, you know, share from your personal thoughts that it is possible. It's not necessarily easy, but here's how you did it. Sure. Well, um, here in Texas, we uh, had a, a fantastic candidate run for a Supreme uh, Texas Supreme Court in the 2018 elections, and he got over the 5% um, barrier, which grants in at least in Texas automatic ballot access for the yes. following for the following uh, election cycle. 
So we didn't have to go out and get signatures this time, but we certainly have in the past. And again, the amount of resources and time that gets dedicated towards collecting signatures, it distracts thoroughly from candidates and, and their own campaigns and getting started and getting their own support. When you're, when you're part, you as a party, you're asking people to donate just so we can appear on the ballot. It's yes. again, such a disadvantage, but uh, you know, fortunately for, for me and the other uh, Texas candidates, uh, we, we had that um, threshold met in 2018. So I had to file uh, with the Secretary of State um, with a notarized form. And it's funny, actually, originally, I was just going to, uh, you know, I, I just, I was, I, I was a little ticked off at who the incumbent was. And I was like, all right, this guy needs a challenger. But I wasn't sure, you know, what level of commitment I could really get involved. And the Libertarian Party actually has kind of three different tiers of uh, commitment if you want to be a candidate. Uh, you can just be literally just be a choice candidate, which is you're just a name on the ballot. You don't have to do any active uh, campaigning or make a website or anything else like that. You can be kind of like a, a, a challenge uh, mm -hmm. candidate. I, I might be getting these wrong, but you can be where you just kind of do a little bit of an online presence and, uh, you know, maybe maybe do a website or at least have a Facebook page or, you know, some sort of social mm -hmm. media uh, following. Or you can be like a really active candidate. And that's what I've kind of transitioned into um, in the matter of the first week uh, that I submitted that paperwork uh, last year. Uh, first, I was just going to, you know, I'll just maybe do online, maybe make a few social media posts here and there. And then once I once I submitted that, uh, you know, that notarized form, I just felt this overwhelming responsibility, <laughs> you know, to stand up and, um, and you know, actually let, you know, challenge that status quo uh, much more actively rather than passively. But still, at the end of the day, the fact that, um, you know, we're running, it gives people in my district, uh, that's Texas second district, by the way, it kind of makes a hook shape around Houston. Mm -hmm. um, it gives people that choice. And if people like me or you watching this don't step up and run, then think about all of the races that are going unchallenged. Yes. In some parts of Texas, there are, there, are, there are races that are so entrenched that the other main party doesn't even field a candidate. Those, yeah. if you can target those races, you can get so much more than the average, um, you know, than the average libertarian candidate result. Um, I, am, I am running in a three-way race against a Republican and Democrat. Um, but the polling I've seen um, on I side with is about four times the, you know, the, the typical libertarian candidate average. So I'm really um, happy with the, you know, the, just the, the impact that I'm making by being a, an active candidate. But again, you don't have to go through all the trouble of, you know, getting the website and collecting donations and getting signs. You can see one of my yard signs right there, um, right there to my right. Um, but you don't have to go do all that. If you just want to give people a choice on the ballot, it's just, um, depending on your state, again, you might have to uh, get some signatures and, you know, do some of that work. But um, I wouldn't recommend if you've never been involved in the party jumping right into being a candidate. I would, I would sit, I would get involved and be around and help out with someone else's for a cycle or two, uh, just so you have more of an understanding of what you're doing. Um, because a lot of our candidates, um, they they do so with some. Um, there's maybe some good experiential uh, training support, but we don't have you know, the hundreds of millions of dollars as, a, as a national party that yeah. can just be thrown at, at random races. So we have to do our, our own fundraising. We have to get creative. We have to, you know, work with people who, who believe in us, whether that's our friends and family in our community. And um, the, uh, the actual, the libertarian candidates this cycle have an amazing interconnected, uh, I, I guess, social media support group where anytime someone gets, uh, you know, hey, I found this good deal on science, or hey, um, I just got an interview with them, I'm going to send them your name, or, or on Twitter, there's this no libertarian under a, under a thousand uh, hashtag, where people are just tagging every candidate they know and uh, getting them more and more followers so they can have a broader reach. Um, but I, I feel like I'm going on a little bit about no, uh, what I else love involved this. to be a candidate. So uh, did you have anything else uh, specific that you wanted to know about that? Well, and the reason that I asked Elliot was, you know, from all of our speakers today, they shared about ways that they've become meaningfully involved in the party. And we've heard about, you know, education, and we've heard about sex workers, and we've heard about, you know, in the case of the ladies from the Texas LP, serving as a secretary or a treasurer for a state campaign. And you following Laura was the perfect opportunity to talk about the experience if, if a woman was considering running for office, because it's something that we want to encourage more of, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, more, the more diverse our own candidates uh, that we put up to the public are, the more people can look at the Libertarian Party and say, hey, this is something that, uh, you know, this is something that we can, that I could see myself doing, you know, if, 
identity politics is not something that I like to focus on, but understanding people's ability to connect in a moment is something that's undeniable. Like I, I don't yes. run because I think that the Libertarian Party needs more white guys who are disaffected <laughs> from the Democrats and Republicans. I'm running based yeah. on the issues that I support. Yes. But to a lot of people, um, you know, who, who they see running and what, you know, what party they're affiliated with, that communicates to them that they as a group, especially if you are a historically disadvantaged or, or you know, downtrodden group, okay, I can find acceptance there. They nominated this person as a candidate that signals to me that there is um, that acceptance and that uh, respect for diversity in, in the party. So I yes. would love to see uh, more candidates apply. Also, we don't, I, you know, I don't typically like it when only one person runs internally for a race in our convention mm -hmm. process. Uh, the more competition we have, uh, the better, because that allows the best possible candidate to emerge. In, in my own uh, particular race, uh, it, it, I didn't know this at the time when I was filing, but two other uh, women actually uh, uh, submitted uh, to be uh, candidates uh, for Congress uh, in Texas District Two, and um, I ended up I, I ended up taking the nomination at the at the county convention w um, where that nomination happened. But it was it was good that there was competition. Um, you know, we got yes. to get up there and give speeches and say what issues are important to us and you know what what matters to us. Um, something that helped me out a lot, uh, I think, uh, to add legitimacy to my campaign was. Uh, by that time, I'd already been uh, I'd already been endorsed by the Houston GLBT political caucus, yes. which um, I was their lone libertarian to receive that endorsement for the primaries. <laughs> and um, me, just by me reaching out to them, that was an that was another uh, you know diverse group that I showed them libertarians care about you. Uh, we care about equality. We care about getting the government off of your back and not having systemic bigotry in place. And yes. you know. That's something that some libertarians say, well, that's not something the government needs to worry about. Why would you say that? But I would I respond, if there's any kind of injustice, if people are being treated differently, then we as libertarians have a moral responsibility to stand up for, um, you know, to stand up for people in that situation. And help remove the barriers the government has created. Exactly. Yes. And it's, it's 2020, and it took a Supreme Court ruling earlier this summer uh, for uh, you know, gender and sexual minorities to even get added as protected classes under the EEOC. So up until June of 2020, you could get fired for being gay, and you couldn't sue for that. And that's that's Definitely. you know when you you consider all the other protected classes, and you know since the Civil Rights Act was passed in the 60s that have emerged, and you think that how can there be this many people in our society that that affects? It's, it was overdue. In fact, that was one of the major um, platform planks I was running on, and it was nice of the Supreme Court to help me out with, uh, with, <laughs> with, with, with my campaign by getting that done for me before I even get elected to office. Whew, not too shabby, Elliot. Yeah, I'm not taking credit <laughs> for it. I'm just glad they did it. <laughs> well, Elliot, you know, why don't you tell people where they can find you and any kind of last parting words on the topic of women's equality or encouraging women to raise their voices and be heard in the liberty movement? Certainly. And I, you know, I am really fortunate uh, to be involved with the Libertarian Party of Texas, where we do have an outstanding leadership uh, a core of, of really amazing qualified women who are, you know, our chair, vice chair, secretary and treasurer. They're all great. And they all were the best people for the job and that just happened organically we didn't say hey let's set out to make this happen this year let's no we just we attracted people who are talented and wanted to share share that talent and i if if you are thinking about you know getting involved politically i'd really like to welcome you to join your, one of your local libertarian meetups um if there's not one or you're in an unincorporated county or state well, not state, we have all the states incorporated, but if you have an unincorporated county, you know, look out, reach out to your state party and see if maybe you can set one up. Um, one thing I learned about um, being involved in this size of a party is that if you see something not being done and you want it to get done, you should probably start figuring out how to do it yourself and invite others to help you along the way rather than just, you know, cheering from the uh, stands and saying, hey, this should be done and then nothing happens and then getting disappointed when nothing happens. So, you know, stand up, be the change you want to see. Um, if you are interested, you can follow me. Um, I have a pretty active social media uh, on Facebook. It's Sherman for Congress. Uh, that's spelled S-C-H-E-I-R-M-A-N and four is spelled out. Uh, and you can actually see the uh, spelling right there next to me this whole yeah. time. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Vote Sherman. Again, S-C-H-E-I-R-M-A-N. 
I'm on Instagram at Truman for Congress. You can also check out my website at TrumanForCongress.com where you can uh, yeah, donate to the campaign if you if you like or sign up to be a local volunteer. Or if you just want to keep up with the with the campaign and you're not on social media, I've got a news feed there that uh, keeps track of most of my posts. So um, I really appreciate it. If you are local in Houston, please reach out. Um, I'm doing getting ready to do some uh, block walking and would love to have your help and support. Um, we've got yard signs to give out. We've got bumper stickers to distribute. And just in general, um, we want to tell people that there's a better choice. And uh, we and I, I've stepped up to help represent that. And I'd like to invite you to do the same. Well, that was excellent. And I just put your link to your website into the chat stream. So Elliot, they can reach you from there. It's good to have new candidates on. Thank you so much, Elliot. It is always a pleasure talking to you, my friend. Likewise. And thank you for doing this. This is amazing. And I hope that you know, people really get the chance to get all of these different perspectives to hear about how important, you know, women are and, you know, the history of women being able to be included in the political process. So again, thank you for doing this. Great way to celebrate uh, women's equality.